Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to graphic novelist Barbara Slade. Her new book, Getting Married and Other Mistakes. Stick around. I'll try not to refer to it by my preferred title. What was I thinking? <laughs> Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of men, women, and children who wish this union would come to an end <laughs> in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, <gasps> Florida. Barbara Slade has told a tale of marital woe in her new book, Getting Married and Other Mistakes. But the good news is that this story is illustrated, so it both takes a little sting out while at the same time lets the zing hit the fan in pictures when it suits her most. Now I suspect this is a story to which many modern women can relate. Uh, heavy pressure on little girls to marry rich but not necessarily smart. Overbearing mothers who see college as a route to an MRS but not an MBA. Recognizing the difference between sex and love and just how creepy a Barbie bride lamp can be on an adolescent girl's bedside <laughs> table. Now Barbara, who joins me today, is a legend in the comic book and graphic novel industry, a place where only a handful of women have made a name for themselves. She's worked for Marvel, DC, Archie, and Disney comics over the years, and is also the author of You Can Do a Graphic Novel. And she's profiled in the book A Century of Women Cartoonists. This is her second appearance on Mr. Media, and Barbara Slate, welcome back to Mr. Media. Thank you. Good to see you. Um, so, uh, what do you have against the sacred institution of marriage anyway, Barbara? Um, well, I tried it. It didn't work. <laughs> and um, a lot of women who read the book and, um, uh, you know, can really relate to that moment when they're walking down the aisle and there's a voice in their head that says, run! <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's interesting how many women have told me similar stories. So why do they really get married? Is it the pressure? Is it, um, is it society? And I think, actually, I think it's changing. I'm certainly not bringing my daughter up to have a goal or her only goal is to get married. Um, but I think in my generation, certainly, and generations before mine, the goal was to get married and have children. And actually, I just rented um, the whole series of Mad Men, and it's taken me all the way back, and I see the difference of women back then and today, and it's really remarkable. It is interesting to see the evolution on that show, which kind of the late 50s starting into the early 60s, the mid 60s, the late 60s, I think we're, have you gotten yeah. through it yet? I don't want to, I don't want to give anything away. No, okay, I have, I I'm, see, uh, I'm in season one, oh. the fifth, the fifth one. Oh, okay, well, then you've got a lot of interesting stuff ahead of you with, with uh, I do. to women. It gets really interesting and it's, uh, <laughs> Matt, Matt, uh, Matt Weiner is, uh, he's got a real eye and an ear for that and I assume that he's about this age and he has lived through it. I recognize so much from it, having grown up in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, right. And, and uh, the graphics, talk about graphic novels, the way he graphically, st I don't know who, I guess he did, he staged it, you know, with everybody smoking cigarettes. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, anyway, let's get back to my book. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we can refer Mad Men, though. Go finish that yeah. series. It'll take. Oh, I, I will. I'll be. I'll be watching it. I watch it over. I watch it one after another. I have to. I have to get my work done in the morning so I can watch it in the afternoon. Got it. So what? What? Um, uh, what made you decide to do this? Was it strictly a, a question of uh, telling your own story, or uh, was there some other, you know, really compelling reason for for doing a, a graphic novel well, in marriage? The, um, what happened was I um, moved from Manhattan to the country. I really had in mind 
that I wanted to write my great American graphic novel. I had been doing a lot of work for um, Archie and writing Betty and Veronica and uh, my characters, most of my characters were licensed. I wrote Barbie and Beauty and the Beast. I love doing those characters, but I wanted to have something that was um, all mine. And um, so I moved from the city to the country where I could have total peace and quiet and not be distracted by all the noise and all my friends. And uh, I came up here and I found total peace and quiet. And it was so quiet. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, so quiet. We're on 15 acres um, surrounded by creeks. And I look out the window and I see birds and I see deer and and I realized that so much of my inspiration was taken from the city that I would sit in coffee shops and overhear conversations and that's where I got so many of my stories and here I I don't speak deer I don't speak bird and um, I started to realize that I I had to go internally and I started telling my story and um, it took a very long time, uh, 14 years, before I got the story out. I know, 14 years. <laughs> but uh, because I had this voice in my head saying, oh, that's just so dopey. Nobody wants to hear that. That's so, what a cliche. And then into my eighth year, I, I did other things besides write this story. I know, I know that you did. <laughs> yeah, but into my eighth year, I suddenly realized that cliches were good and I was one of I don't, I don't know how many women who got married and got divorced and and listened to everybody except my own voice and so I started seeing that this theme was universal and once I figured out that it I really did have something to say, even though it was a cliche and that cliches were good. Um, I was able to write the story without those voices in my head telling me how nobody wants to read this. And um, once the voices were out of my head, it took a long time. I was um, I, I got um, I got to um, the other press and they loved it. And Judith Brewwich. Um, bought it so that was that was a miracle that was wonderful and um, the story I think you indicate I mean the story is based on your own story you're not the character per se right nobody I, I have her as a photographer it, it being a cartoonist is a very quiet um, lonely life yeah. I love being a cartoonist but it's uh, being a photographer, you're out there more and you're taking pictures and you're seeing light. And so I took that as something I really wanted my main character to have interaction with people rather than be sitting in a studio and go, th going to comic conventions. But then, you, then that's so crazy. <laughs> and that's, that's an experience that a lot of women might not connect to in ways that they might a more traditional. Yes. Uh, yeah. Now, I got to ask you because I'm just, I'm just realizing as I'm looking at you, uh, you've got. Uh, this shock of red hair, but the cover of the book is not a redhead, and yet your character Joe Hudson is a redhead. What is that a right. was that a sales decision to not go with a redhead on the cover? It was the bride, you know, as you know, in without giving too much of the story away, the brides in the photographs start speaking to Joe, who's the protagonist, and uh, I chose to go with the bride. Got it. I'm partial to redheads, so I felt like it should have been a redhead, but okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, now, is, how, much, how much difference is there between Joe Hudson, the character, and Barbara Slate, the real person telling the story? Is it pretty close? Is, you know, the reality pretty close to what we're reading? It, uh, I, I went back to, I, I found that every time I went back to my childhood and remembered the story, the story about the dog, you know, the dog, and that was the first experience that she had with seeing this, seeing sex with these dogs. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, 
which was horrifying. I'm sure that's affected me in many ways. But I, every time I found a story that was so um, compelling, um, I used it. Uh, the Barbie lamp, uh, actually, I had taken Barbie in and out of the story. I, I really felt like Barbie was too much of a cliche. But then when I showed the work, I showed all my chapters to all these wonderful women at Other Press. There were eight women and one man in this room, and they all had a Barbie story. And I said, okay, Barbie's back in. And I didn't want to make it Barbie as the um, doll. But I did remember a lamp beside me that was a bride. So I just put these things together, you know, making little mixes and matches. But a, a lot of the stories, um, of course, she's a photographer, so some of the stories were not true at all. You know, how she saw light and, and shadow. Um, but I see that visually anyway. I, I love black and white. And what about, so, what about the relationship between Joe and her mother? Is that kind yeah, of close that's to home? Me. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was, well, you know, I, it's a funny thing. I, um, I've been working on this book so long, and, um, and I've been, you know, my mother asked me about it. How, you know, I will say to her, like 14 years ago, oh, I'm working on a book. Um, and she'll say, um, the next time I call her, which would be a week later, she'll say, is your book finished? <laughs> funny how, how moms know <laughs> about that stuff. <laughs> and then after about, 12 or 13 years, she stopped asking about it, and uh, so finally it was finished, and I really didn't want to send it to her. I thought that she would be insulted, and she's 90, I don't know, 90 something, 95 or something, and um, I didn't want to upset her, Um, but she called me and said, does everybody have your book except me? And I said, well, no, I only have so many copies. She goes, I want three copies. So I sent her the copies. And um, I never heard a word. Never (laughs) heard. I got the book. I like the drawings. I like the writing. Not a peep. So I decided not to ask, did you like my book? (laughs) I think the silence was a good clue yeah. that uh, the character was familiar to her, <laughs> although maybe it wasn't. I don't know. Yeah, wow. I don't know. Wow. So but silence is golden. Still, yeah, so still not a word. I mean, there, there's no not punchline one, to that story. I mean, she just there never... is not one punchline, not one word. It's remarkable, isn't it? Yeah, actually. Uh, and do you have siblings? Yes, I have a sister and a brother, and my sister lives near my mother, and she's a wonderful sister. She takes care of my mother. She doesn't throw out guilt. She's, she's great. And my brother lives in Atlanta, and he's a photographer, actually. And how did your sister react to the story, or did she not react either? Um, <laughs> that's a funny one, too. She, I think she liked the story, and she's She's very proud of me, and she, um, but uh, there's, there were a couple parts she thought w- were a little rough. I know uh, it seems like any time you deal with siblings, uh, perspective on parents is always so different. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I know what my view of my father is, and my sister has a different view, and my brother has a different view, and of course my mother has a very different view of the man. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's interesting. What seems like but, absolute truth to some of us, you know, is uh, shades of gray. Pardon, pardon the reference, but, you know. Yeah, it is remarkable. And, um, and it, my sister and I are total opposite in personality and what everything about us is really, really opposite. We're great friends. We, we get along very well. We're great sisters, I should say. We're really great sisters. And uh, but total opposite. And any time I will say anything about our childhood, um, she doesn't like to go there. Uh, you know, it's just different personalities. Interesting. And so, you know, I'm not sure about this. Have you just been married the one time? Yes. Okay. And now I've been with Richard Minsky for 
we're all going on 25 years. Wow. And uh, when we first got together, um, I told him that I didn't want to get married. And he told me he didn't want to get married. And our egos were <laughs> so big that we both thought, ah, you know, I know he really wants. Oh, I know he really wants to marry me, but and he thought I really wanted to get married. And I guess into our twentieth year, we said, you know what, <laughs> it's really working out very well. Neither one of us really wanted. He got married, and I think he was married for about two weeks. Two weeks. And, well, yeah, I think his marriage lasted for two weeks, wow. and um, so, I, I, but the divorce took a couple years. But uh, yeah, so it really was something both of us had no interest in. Although, I've seen a couple wedding gowns in these second-hand stores mm. that I have, like, this fantasy of being 75 and walking down my steps in a wedding gown. Because I never wore a wedding gown. Even when I got married, I kind of wore something um, blue. And um, so I do have a fantasy about that. So I've been broaching the subject. That when I'm 75, I would like to get married. Obviously a long time from now. Thank you so much. Not as long as one might think. <laughs> and the, the, uh, the, the marriage that's uh, illustrated in the story, how long did it actually last? Um, seven years. Seven years. Yeah. All right. And... Uh, Anything good you can say about it? It doesn't seem like there's anything good that comes from the story in the book in terms of the... uh, Well, um, you know, my sister and brother-in-law are happily married. I see that. Are you happy? You're happily. You sound like you're happily married. I, I read your your posts on Facebook. You sound. I think you refer to your wife as your amazing wife. You know, I, I, you seem happy. No, yeah, that's not. We're good. We're good. I don't remember we're calling good. her amazing. I'm gonna have to go. No, I. Something else. But I, I, love, I think uh, I give her credit for being very tolerant. Okay, same <laughs> thing. <laughs> but I, I've seen I see people who are happily married, and uh, my daughter wants to get married, mm. and she's in love. She's fifteen, her first love, and uh, I think it's a beautiful thing. But I do think it's really a fairy tale that has been started very long ago, and. Um, I think that um, the um, it, it, there's a lot of work and a lot of of really understanding each other. I, th I think therapy before you get married is a really good thing. At six months, just to talk about issues, you know, do you really want to have children? If you want children, how many? Uh, how do you see the the lifestyle divided? Um, you know, who's doing the cooking? Who's doing? You know, who's going to bring home the uh, the bread and who's going to be staying home with the children if you have it or are you both get you know all these things that nobody really thinks of because what happens so often is the wedding plans start very early and the wedding becomes the big thing and the dress and the bridesmaids and the drama if you don't invite this one and all that and then you forget about going through, you know, the real situation once you get married. I just had, it's interesting, uh, just in the last three weeks, uh, I had never known anyone personally to elope. And in the last, on the same day, uh, our neighbors across the street and one of my uh, daughter's uh, high school teachers and, and his uh, fiancé, they both reached the same conclusion. They both eloped on the same day, completely unrelated to each other. And uh, they just, they're so happy that they, they, they just set aside the whole rigmarole of the wedding and the family. The families were driving them crazy, you know, with their demands, and they wanted to yes. be this way and that way. And I thought, you know, I think they did the right thing. I mean, Get out of town. Yeah. I mean, if you can't, we had a, I think my wife and I had a slightly different situation in that um, my parents were a thousand miles away. Her parents were older and really didn't want to deal with all the details, and they just left it up to us, and they paid for it, which was very kind of them. Um, and, they, you know, we just had the wedding that we wanted to have, which was great. But these other couples, they were getting just ridiculous pressure, and they're all grown-ups. They're not like 18 and 19 years old. I know. Yeah. So, uh, let me ask you, so um, I'm just doing the math here, and I apologize if this is too personal a question. <laughs> um, but uh, so your daughter is uh, Richard's daughter, I'm guessing. No, 
No, no, no. I um, adopted Samantha, and um, uh, I was. Uh, I am a very. Um, um, let me. I'm going to say. I'm going to try to be kind to myself. I am slow in. <laughs> Wait, that's that kind. And grasping what it is that I want. It takes me a very long time. Okay. So um, when I was in my 20s, I had no interest in having children. And in my 30s. And it didn't happen until I was 40 mm -hmm. that all of a sudden, you know that T-shirt that says, Oh my God, I forgot to have children? <laughs> yeah. That was me. I got it. And then I was getting divorced. So... It wasn't working out, and um, so I started adoption proceedings, and it took a very long time. But, you know, when you have that moment of truth, when you say, this is really what I want, because I was still wishy-washy. Now I'm, now I'm 42, 43. By the time my child is this age, I'm going to be that. All that stuff started to come in, and then I turned... Um, 48, something like that. And I said, okay, either you really want this or you don't. And it was something in my mind just said, okay, I'm going to really, really go for it now. And then, boom, um, the birth mother um, connected with me. And um, we talked on the phone for five months. Um, Samantha has a wonderful birth mother who um, couldn't manage uh, one more child. And so um, we became great friends on the telephone, and um, and I just knew this was going to be a special child, and she's a special child. She's wonderful. Right now, she's at Emma Willard. She's at uh, boarding school at Emma Willard, um, this wonderful school that's just a few miles, you know, 40 minutes away. Anyway, I don't want to go on. No, it's and okay. I, I was just but, trying to do the math, because I knew we had daughters who were roughly the same age, and... Right. I, I, I wasn't trying to be overly personal, and I apologize. No, and you're was, looking at me and saying, what are you doing with a 15-year-old? No, 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 not, not, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. Because uh, I, wanted, I wanted to get to ask you about, so we have daughters roughly the same age, and uh, you've, you've been through this. First of all, I wonder if your daughter probably has, uh, has read the book, and if you would recommend it to girls that age to, to, to read something like this, and then what advice do you have for them after they've, if and after they've read the book about you know, proceeding with their lives, whether it's marriage or whatever. My, my daughter grew up on Archie Comics because I was the writer of Betty and Veronica and every month we'd get a stack of comics. So she, that's how she learned to read okay. is through those characters. She knows all those characters backwards and forwards and she started writing with me. She became my co-author and uh, she has a really funny way of seeing things and she acts out the characters a lot of times I just take notes on her dialogue so when I started writing getting married and other mistakes she would look over my shoulder and say mom what are you doing that's gross or <laughs> that kind of thing but um she's read it I don't know if she's read it from the beginning to the end but she has a, she has a pretty good idea of what it is she's I I have to say, she's kind of cool. I mean, she's not too embarrassed by me so far. But um, I would, she's. I wouldn't recommend. I would recommend Archie for a, a girl, even fifteen, to be sitting around in the dorm room when I go to her school, and I bring some comic books, and it's a relief. You know, these kids, these girls, because uh, Emma Willard is an all-girls school. These girls have so much pressure on them it's scholastic it's such a t it's really um, it's rigorous and uh, they're so motivated and to sit around and read an Archie comic is fun yeah. to sit around and read I got married and other mistakes I don't think so but I would I wouldn't recommend it for them but I would recommend it for 18 19 especially if you're getting married so go in with your eyes open I, th I guess is what you would say I would say that. Not to put words in your mouth, Barbara. I would say that. <laughs> there goes my words. Um, so let me let me change gears a little bit uh, while we still have a little time. I want to ask you about telling the story in the graphic novel format itself. 
Um, and that is for people who don't know what we're talking about somehow. I don't know how, they, how you got this far without, without knowing it, but you know, words and pictures versus just doing a novel and telling a story that way. Um, what, what is it about this story that lent itself to being told in this way? Or is it just, I mean, this is what you do, so this is the way you're going to tell a story. I, I always see pictures and words. Always. And when I read novels, I am so impressed that people can paint a picture through words. I, I, it, to me, just painting the picture mm-hmm. is easier. Just drawing it and showing it. And, and also in a graphic novel, comic book, it, the picture reads um, first. So you, you read the, well, that's not exactly right. The, the art moves the story forward. So you get the picture. And um, I love, I, I, I don't know why picture books stopped in third grade. I think they're coming back. I know that my publisher um, from You Can Do a Graphic Novel is interested in um, uh, visuals with books because it's so much easier for kids. But, you know, with comic books, I've always, I've always seen everything first. I've always seen the picture and the words at the same time. So that's why I've been able to do all those comic books, you know, The Beauty and the Beast, and I lay them out. I didn't do the drawings, but I lay them out, and I, I, love, I, I love doing the layouts, and, and I love the close-ups. It's like doing a movie. All right. Well, and uh, the only thing left I have to ask you is uh, what's next? What do you follow this with? Well, I need a... Um, a break with the uh, graphic novels at this moment, but I've been teaching a lot. And teaching has just opened up a whole world to me, and I'm going to book fairs, and um, I'm actually in front of people talking, which is mind-boggling to me. I never thought that I would do that because being a cartoonist, you know, you're really by yourself and you're behind the scenes. So suddenly, because I've been invited to these places and I started to teach, I realized that it's actually fun, and I do slideshows, and I talk about my career, and, you know, from coming to New York when I was, um, God, late 60s, and and um, and all, all the things that happened in those decades, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and how women um, have been changing through these decades. It's really... Um, uh, uh, a talk about feminism and um, that kind of thing. So um, I'm getting my talks ready. That's that's my new thing. And and also playing on the computer, trying to understand Facebook and all this social media is so intimidating to me. But I'm getting better. Very good. Right. Well, uh, always a pleasure to talk to you. And folks, uh, you can find Barbara Slate's new graphic novel, Getting Married and Other Mistakes. Uh, in fine bookstores everywhere, or you can order it right now at a great price at mrmedia.com. Just look, oh. look down here on the page. There's a link. You'll see it. Um, Barbara, you want to give out your website? Let people know where they can find more out? Uh, barbaraslate.com. Um, you can do a graphic novel.com. Right. Those are the two. And are you on uh, Twitter and Facebook also? I'm on Facebook at uh, Getting Married and Other Mistakes. Okay. And... Um, Oh, I, I think I tweeted two times. Right. So stick, <laughs> stick to Facebook. Find her on Facebook. She's there. I know she's there. That's how yeah, we connected are. this time. Um, and, and so LinkedIn, I'm starting to figure out what that's about. It's not easy. No, it's and it's a little confusing. LinkedIn's a little more complicated than the other. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Well, uh, Barbara, it is always a pleasure. We uh, we've had a lot of chatting before the show today. We we got to meet Sparky, your dog. We saw we caught up with Richard <laughs> briefly. And uh, it was very nice to spend some time with you this morning. And uh, Thank you, Bob. My pleasure, and good luck with the new book. Thanks so much. You can see and hear almost a 1,000 Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love from Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. 
It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows, get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin. Here's The Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The Tech Crunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, Blackberry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. That's stitcher.com slash MR Media. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com. And tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening.